You're listening to episode number 85 of the Keto Diet Podcast. Today, we're chatting about the actual ingredients in wine, aka toxins, what to look for in a healthy keto-friendly wine, what happens to your ketones after a glass or two of wine, why women react to red wine, and what to do about it. Try saying that sentence five times. That was really hard. (laughs) And so much more. The show notes and full transcript for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash email. 85. I got one cool thing to share with you guys today, and that is that I have been addicted to sugar for many, many, many years. And I know that it's something that many of us struggle with and continue to struggle with as we're working on our relationship to our ketogenic diet. So I've put together a three-page downloadable PDF that you guys can grab at healthfulpursuit.com slash sugar, which gives you five steps that you can take right now to end your sugar addiction. These are the five steps that I've taken over the last couple of years to finally end my addiction to sugar. It's working great, feeling awesome, and I want you to feel the same. So again, you can head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash sugar. The link will be in the show notes too, if you're a little bit confused of where to go. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women, so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, heal your body quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. And now, here's your host. You might know her as the Keto Queen. She's the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of Happy Keto Body, and she loves dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo, Leanne Vogel. The podcast is supported by the following awesome brands. Can't find the links? Simply check out the show notes of today's episode. First up is Thrive Market. Now, I just, I love Thrive Market. And if you haven't tried them yet and you're based in the US, you just should. And we put together a really, really great offer. Everyone who uses the following link, thrivemarket.com slash keto, will get an instant $60 off their next three orders, plus free shipping and a free 30-day membership. Imagine a website that you could go to on a Thursday at 3 p.m. and just order all of your favorite things in one place. And you could get all giddy when you're like, how much do you want for collagen? Seriously? I can get that much? Or seriously, I can get two bottles of olive oil for that price? That's cheaper than Costco. All of that goodness all wrapped up into one website. I just get so excited. Every time my Thrive Market box gets delivered, I, I'm i just so pumped that I'm able to use a service. And I hope that if you're not using Thrive Market and you're just looking for a really great place to get your groceries at a discounted rate, that you give it a try. Again, that's thrivemarket.com slash keto. Next up is Paleo Valley. I've been eating their grass-fed, grass-finished beef sticks forever. And what I love about their sticks is that each stick has 1 billion probiotic CFUs. So yeah, I'm getting the benefit of eating protein, but I'm also helping my gut in the process. Now they just came out with delicious pasture raised turkey sticks and they come in two flavors, original cranberry orange. And I personally like them more than their beef sticks. They are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, zero grams of sugar, all of the awesome things that we look for in a great product. You can head on over to paleovalley.com slash keto and receive your instant 20% off. Lastly, we got Dry Farm Wines. And if you love wine, you're going to love Dry Farm Wines. You can drink their wines while staying in ketosis. They only source the highest quality natural wines from small, sustainable family farms. Now, I'll be the first to say that I don't drink a lot of wine. Wine is not my jam. I just don't really enjoy drinking. But I know that there are lots of people out there, many women included in this, that just love wine and get really frustrated that they can't have wine or don't feel good drinking wine on their ketogenic diet. And so we wanted to introduce you to Dry Farm Wines. Many of the women in the Healthful Pursuit team use it, love it, and listeners of the podcast can get an extra bottle of wine added to their first Dry Farm Wine order for just one penny. You can sign up for your first case now by heading on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash wine. 
Today's guest is Todd White, who's a self-described biohacker who practices daily meditation, him wolf breathing, cold thermogenesis, a ketogenic diet, full day fasting, and so much more. He's also the founder of Dry Farm Wines, the only health quantified wine merchant in the world. Dry Farm Wines sources only organic wines from small family farms that meet the purest standards of health and taste. Every wine is sugar-free, low alcohol, and friendly to all diets, including keto. So today's chat is with Todd White, who is the owner of Dry Farm Wines, which is a partner of the Keto Diet Podcast. All partners help pay for the running of this podcast, making sure that we have a podcast manager, a quality assurance manager, an editor, recording equipment, and so much more. I try to coordinate offers that everyone will enjoy. And you guys asked that when I interview a partner of the podcast that I let you guys know that that was the case before you listened to the interview. So here is your notice that that's a thing that's happening today. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's interview. Hey, Todd, how are you? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Thank you for having me on today. I'm looking forward to talking everything that is natural wine. Yes. And I'm looking forward to asking you everything that is natural wine because you know all about it and I know very little. So before we dive into all of the questions that our listeners have submitted all about wine, uh, for listeners that may not be familiar with you, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about you? Well, I am uh, a health fanatic. A uh, crazy biohacker. I've been uh, biohacking and sort of into fanatic health. When I say fanatic, I mean just a deep commitment to using the best of what we know in science and technology and um, information to to live, you know, a cleaner, better, healthier life. And we uh, there's 15 of us on staff. All of us are ketogenic. We all practice intermittent fasting, meditation, cold thermogenesis. So we just have sort of a, a big, big commitment to health. So I think we have a lot to share with the audience today. That's awesome. And I always like to ask listeners that are keto that come on the podcast, what does keto mean to you? Well, I mean, scientifically, I mean, clinically, uh, ketogenic diet produces uh, ketones as your primary energy source. Of course, we're still using some glucose, but for us, the ketogenic lifestyle, I, like most people, adapted a ketogenic lifestyle or experimented with a ketogenic diet first beginning about four years ago. I've been practicing a ketogenic lifestyle for about four years. And so even before it was fashionable, I've experimented with it like many people do to break through kind of a pesky weight loss plateau. And uh, once that was achieved, which was fairly quickly, I, as a biohacker, just experimented with it longer and a little bit deeper and started doing blood monitoring and kind of calibrating my ketones and how I felt. And, and I just never returned to a standard diet. I was already low carb. I just wasn't fully keto uh, before I started experiment, experimenting with, with ketosis. But I remained ketotic because of the cognitive benefits and the energy benefits and the efficiencies. Like I travel a lot. I also do 24-hour intermittent fasting, so I only eat once a day. And so with my travel life, being in ketosis and also uh, incorporating intermittent, cast, intermittent fasting just makes my life a whole lot simpler and a whole lot more energized. So that's, that's kind of why we practice a ketogenic diet. Amazing. And what brought you to wine? Like why wine? Like what was it about it that you're just like, I'm going to build a business about this? Oh, what brought me to natural wine? Yeah. Oh, wow. So that was kind of a journey. So I had, you know, again, I had been in ketosis and like dry farm wines is about a little bit over two years old, but I had been in ketosis and practicing, you know, pretty, pretty strict clean, healthy diet for a long time. And I found that wines were making me feel bad. And initially I thought it was just the alcohol. I thought maybe I was becoming less tolerant to alcohol. And so I started experimenting with drinking less wine. uh, And then I quit drinking wine for a while and a period I call suffering through sobriety. And I really (laughs) didn't enjoy that because I really love wine. I have a lifelong relationship with wine. And so I, you know, I started actually dosing wine down. I really thought it was the alcohol. And so I started drinking, this was in the wintertime about 
three years ago, I started mixing wine with hot tea for kind of a mulled wine thing. And what I was trying to do is just get lower doses. So I wasn't drinking full glasses of wine. I would come home. I don't drink in the daytime, but I would come home after work and have a hot tea with a little wine in it. And I found that was quite, it was quite healthier and I felt better. And, and, and I thought it was really I was cutting back the alcohol in a significant way without stopping drinking. So I thought, well, this is awesome. But the problem was I was kind of bored with it, right? It wasn't very interesting. It didn't taste great. And I just, it just, just wasn't a lot of fun. And it, I was missing wine and the, and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the romance that is wine and the beauty that is wine and the art that is wine. I was missing all that. So I'm talking to a friend of mine and who's the smartest person I know in the wine business. And I said, hey, I want to make some wine. I had made wine before. I said, I want to make some wine that's low alcohol because I think alcohol is really not healthy for me. And for your audience, let me say alcohol is toxic and poisonous. It's a very dangerous drug. And I want to talk about that in a moment. But so I thought maybe I was just drinking too much alcohol, and that's what was calling, causing me to feel bad. So I decided I was going to make a wine, and I asked my friend, who's like a you know a chemist and an expert in wine, I was like, how low in alcohol can I make a wine and have it still taste like wine? And we talked about that, and in that conversation, he's like, have you drank any of these low-alcohol wines, these natural low-alcohol wines from Europe? And I was like, no. What? <laughs> uh, I was like, what? So he's like, yeah, you should try. You know, you can get some lower alcohol wines. There's not any, none are produced in the United States, but, you know, you can find them in Europe. So I went to the wine store and I walked in to the most famous wine store in San Francisco, not knowing anything about this topic. I'd never heard of low alcohol wines before or natural wines. Didn't know. I thought all wines were natural, as your audience probably thinks. It's one of the most common questions I get, like, on all wines natural? And we'll talk about why they're not in a moment. So anyway, that was it. And I walked in. And I was like, hey, I'm looking for some low alcohol wines. Can you point me to them? They're like, look at me like I have a third eye. Right. And they're like, they have no idea what I'm talking about. They're like, we don't know what the alcohol is, but you can walk around and turn bottles around and look for yourself. So I did. And I bought a whole bunch of these wines, not knowing what they were. And about half of them I poured down the sink because they tasted terrible. But there were a few of them that kind of stood out. And then I was like, okay. And then I made a few more calls. And then I really dove down into the natural wine world. And when I got there and discovered what natural wines were and why they were different, combined with low alcohol and sugar-free, then I started to kind of quantify a process for selecting wines. So anyway, that went on for six or eight months before I started sharing these wines with friends since I lived in the wine country and I had made wine before, I knew about I knew about lab testing wine. So I started picking out wines that I really loved, and then I started taking lab samples on them and testing them and quantifying them for health. And so that led to me selecting some specific wines that I liked. I wasn't in the business or anything yet. I was just trying to figure it out. I started sharing these wines with friends, and they were like, oh, my gosh, where did I get these wines? You know, they were like... These wines are delicious and I don't get a hangover and, you know, I don't get messy and I don't feel bad and none of the negative remnants. So what just to wrap this up, what initially began as a journey just to lower alcohol, it, I, what I discovered was it wasn't just the alcohol and wines that were making me feel bad. It was all of these other things are being put into commercial wines. And when I say commercial wines, I'm talking about anything that's not naturally produced. And that's almost all of wines. So it's it the natural wine category is less than 1% of all the wines in the world. So that's that's kind of what led me down the path and sort of a quick story. So many questions I have now. So how are wines natural versus not natural? What is that process and what do you mean? Well, there's not an official categoric definition for natural wine. I can there's not an official one. Not there's not there's no governing body that says this is a natural wine. But here's what I can tell you the generally accepted the generally accepted term and what our definition means. And so commercial wines, which there are about 200,000 winemakers in the world. There're less than 500 winemakers in the world and primarily all of them are in Europe that make natural wines. And all the wines we drink and sell are all from Europe. There's no domestic wine producers who meet wines to our health specifications. There are a handful of natural wine producers in the United States, but they do not meet our criteria. And our criteria for natural wines 
are dry farming, which means there's no irrigation. And irrigation is the first intervention into nature's logic in, in grape growing. And the United States leads the world in grapevine irrigation. So nearly almost 100% of vineyards in the United States are irrigated. It's illegal. It is a crime to irrigate a grapevine in most of Europe. And the reason being is the Europeans who've been making wine for 3,000 years know what I know. The moment you irrigate a grapevine, you fundamentally change the how this vine relates to the creation and ripening of fruit, the physiology of the ripening of its fruit, and also its whole relationship with the earth and its neighbor. And we can talk more about that. But so first of all, dry farming. Number two, no chemicals of any kind use in farming or for the benefit of the plant, no synthetic fertilizers, no herbicides, no pesticides, 100% organic. Actually, it's beyond organic. So either organic or biodynamic farming. And biodynamic farming is a prescriptive form of organic farming. And again, because of our limited time, we don't have a lot of time to go down too technically on all these issues. But so no irrigation, organic or biodynamic farming. A very important third is that the wines are fermented with native yeast that are indigenous to the vineyard where the wine is grown. So every grape, every wine grape has yeast on the skin and natural wines are fermented with that native yeast. Commercial wines, which are more than 99% of all the wines in the marketplace, commercial wines are fermented with genetically modified commercial yeast. And the reason that's happening is because commercial yeast are much easier to work with for the winemaker. They're much sturdier, and they tolerate bigger volumes and more unstable conditions. A native yeast is very fragile and can't, can't be used in fermenting very high quantities of wine, and it requires a lot of coddling. So it's just more difficult to work with. Commercial winemakers don't want to be bothered with it. So number four, no, no additives or additions in the wine. So in the United States, there are 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Those additives range from pretty innocuous to some pretty nasty chemicals. And most all commercial wines contain additives. One of the reasons is it's impossible to make wines in very large quantities without the use of these chemicals because the environment bacterially is just too unstable. And so, again, it requires a lot of coddling to work without these chemicals and additives. Your audience doesn't know about these 76 additives for this reason. Wine is the only major food group without a contents label on it. And the reason it doesn't have a contents label is not an accident. The wine industry in the United States has spent tens of millions of dollars in lobby money to keep contents labeling off of wine for the simple reason. They don't want you to know what's really in it because it's not just fermented grape juice. That's what they would have you to believe is in it. But in fact, it's filled with all these additives, color agents, and other chemical treatments, some of which are quite toxic. Uh, this is the reason this story is not, not well known or hasn't been well known up until now. And so anyway, the, in, so in addition to that, our wines must meet three other categories and definitions that are not true for all natural wines, but we place a few more restrictions. So our wines must be sugar-free, and we lab test every wine for a whole array of, uh, of attributes, including sugar. So our wines at Dry Farm Wines must be sugar-free. They must also be low alcohol. That means 12.5% or below. Most commercial wines are 14 to 17% alcohol. There's more good news about the wine industry and the government. The alcohol stated on a bottle by law is not required to be accurate. And so oftentimes when you're looking at a bottle of wine, you're looking at alcohol, it's misstated. And typically it's under the actual amount. So if it says 14% on the bottle, by law, it can be as high as 15.5% uh, and you wouldn't know it. And number three, we do not allow the use of any new oak products because of methanol contamination from wood into wine, which is a toxin. So it's very common now for, for wines to be flavored with oak chips, sawdust, or even new oak barrels. We, don't allow the, we do not allow anything other than neutral wood, 
which is a barrel that has been seen six or seven vintages where it no longer imparts any flavor or methanol into the wine. So that's uh, that's kind of the categoric definition of natural wine. So what's happening in the commercial wine business, which is everything you see in your grocery store or wine shop, what's happening in the commercial wine business is you've had this massive consolidation. Same thing that's happened in our food supply, a massive con- corporate consolidation driven by money and greed, which is the same reason you irrigate. The only reason to irrigate a grapevine is to increase yield to make the fruit weigh more. The more the fruit weighs, the more valuable it is. Fruit is sold by the ton. So all of this, what's happening in our wine supply is the same thing happening in our food supply is really about greed. As an example, the top 52% of all the wines manufactured in the United States are made by just three giant conglomerates. And the top 30 companies make over 70% of all the wine that you see on shelves in the stores. And you don't know that because these multi-billion dollar conglomerates All this information is available online. There's not anything I've told your audience here that they can't search for online. Additives in wine, top wine makers, top wine companies. All this is genetically modified yeast in wine. All this is online. It's just that nobody knows to look for it. And it's been a big, deep, dark, dirty secret from the wine business. So these, the reason that you don't realize that, that just three companies make over half of all the wine you're seeing on the shelf is because these multi-billion dollar conglomerates hide behind thousands of brands and labels to have consumers believe that they're drinking from a chateau or a farmhouse, when in fact, most of the time they're drinking from these massive factories in central California. So that's what's happening on the commercial side. You're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> I just, I mean, we talk, we talk, we're so hyper-focused on, you know, grass-fed, grass-finished meat and making sure that, you know, our produce is organic and so many of us are drinking wine and, you know, incorporating into our ketogenic diet and thinking like balance and awesome when (laughs) there's a lot of ingredients in there that we should, like, if we were to actually read the labels of some of this wine, I could probably guarantee that at least 97% of us wouldn't drink it. (laughs) Right. So, I mean, if if it had a contents label and uh, which we think every wine should have a contents label, if it had a contents label on it, it would look like the rest of processed food that you read labels on have a whole bunch of chemical names that you didn't know what they were, color agents, dyes, you know, you, you would be astonished at what you wouldn't even know what they, if you pick up a processed food box. Now you can't, you don't know what half the stuff in it is, no. right? The same thing with a wine label would appear exactly the same way. So it's, you know, we live, this is not marketing for us. We live this way. This is our lifestyle. We live a natural life. We eat organic. We eat clean. We're ketogenic. You know, we're into fasting. I mean, we're, this is our life. You know, we're doing this. And I speak all over the country on not only this, but also on on ketogenic diet and how to eat in restaurants and any number of topics around a ketogenic lifestyle. And so, you know, this is how we live. So it's not we're not marketing something. We're we're living a life and sharing it with people who we know also care about what they put in their body. Mm -hmm, Totally. And you mentioned alcohol being poisonous. Can we chat a little bit more about that? Um, Alcohol is extremely poisonous. Right. I mean, alcohol is dangerous. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people die from alcohol every year. Right. I mean, it's, it's like it's like one of the most dangerous drugs on the planet. I mean, it happens to be legal. Here's the reason that low alcohol wines matter. Right. I mean, and, and the reason that we only I, most of the wines I drink are between 11 and 11 and a half percent, which is kind of a sweet spot for me in terms of taste and and also the effect. So here's what I want from wine experience. This is why, look, wines, the natural wines, until 100 years ago, more more specifically 70 years ago or 60 years ago, all wines were made naturally. In fact, irrigation, which I've spoken about, which is super dangerous for driving up alcohol levels in wine, no reason to get into science about why that's true, but irrigation drives up, is one of the reasons that we don't sell any domestic wines. It's because irrigation ultimately produces higher sugar in the fruit and then consequently higher alcohol. But so irrigation didn't even come to the United States until 1973 for grape farming. And even in Europe, where irrigation isn't used, but additives, there are 56 additives approved by the, for the EU, 
although natural winemakers, of course, don't use them. But here's the thing. Wine, the beauty of wine, the majesty of wine, the art of wine, the poetry in the bottle that is the expression of wine experience for us happens around the dinner table. Right. And so we don't drink during the daytime, which is very unusual for people in the in the wine business. But we don't think daytime drinking is is healthy. So we don't drink during the daytime. The other thing that drinking does, as you're probably aware, is the moment that we take in a substrate energy source like alcohol, we're going to stop fat burning. Right. That's that's just the fact. And so if you want to be a 24 hour fat burner, you're not going to be able to drink wine. Right. Because alcohol is a substrate energy source and your body's going to deal with that exogenous. The body can't absorb alcohol, so it's going to have to process it. So fat burning is going to stop when you start drinking. That's OK. I'm burning fat all day aggressively through ketosis and and I'm you know very, very, very lean as a result. So I'm not too worried about stopping fat burning for a few hours at night while I drink some beautiful wines. But wine for us is not a daytime activity. It's it's typically we open it around the dinner table. And here's what wine does. Its beauty is that it lifts that creative spirit. It it lifts our connection to other people. It makes us slightly more vulnerable, right? It's also a beautiful art form. It just, it tastes the aromatics. It's just, it's just a very, it's just something romantic about it. But in community, it also lowers that window of vulnerability, which is why people bond around alcohol in the, in the correct amount. So this is the reason that we think drinking low alcohol wines is so critically important, is that we want, really want that, we want to retain that cognitive connection, that discussion, that creative expression that gets elevated, the euphoria. These are all the beautiful and positive things that happen with very moderate alcohol use. Right. And the reason that I don't drink spirits, you know, in the in the keto and the paleo movement, I mean, there's you know, there's a lot of focus around tequila as an example, because it's, you know, it's a clean distilled distilled liquor that's made from a plant. The problem is it's 45 percent alcohol. And from my perspective, that's just a big problem. Right. Most people don't have a drink. They have several drinks. And the higher the alcohol, the slippier the slope. Right. So alcohol is like a domino drug. I mean, the more you the more you go down that path, the slippier that slope becomes. Right. So for me, if I can just ingest an inherent product that's lower, inherently lower in alcohol, you know, it just I can have I drink one, one and a half bottles of wine every day, but I'm drinking very low alcohol wine that's clean. That's also with a meal over a course of three or four hours. Right. Five hours. So. It's it's alcohol is very dangerous. And we, 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 we the toxicity of alcohol is well known. We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But but more importantly, how can we drink less and still have the enjoyment of moderate doses? And particularly for women, that's important. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I chat about wine and dry farm wines with my people and they're like, yeah, but ketosis and you mentioned it a little bit in that when you have some wine, you're, you might not be in ketosis throughout the night. I'm assuming that you jump back into ketosis the next morning. Is that a big concern to you or what's your relationship between wine and ketosis and how do you how do you view that? No, so our wines do not take me or anyone outside of the ketosis. Let me be clear. What they what wine does do or any alcohol is going to stop your fat burning. It's not going to interrupt your ketotic state. So our wines don't take me out of ketosis. In fact, Dr. Dominic Diagostino, who's probably the best known ketogenic researcher in, in America and across the world, endorses our wines, did a Facebook posting last year where he actually did blood testing while drinking our wines, you know, because we'd made this claim to him. I knew him through the ketogenic speaking community. And, um, you know, and he actually did independent of us. We didn't even know what he was doing. He actually did independent blood testing on himself while drinking our wines. He's a wine drinker. The problem with wines that will take you out of ketosis is where they contain sugar. So remember, our wines are lab tested by us. And we know every single one of them is sugar-free. And not all wines are sugar-free, particularly commercial wines. So if a wine has sugar in it, that's going to take you, or that's going to potentially take you out of ketosis. But as you know, we're all different in terms of 
how our ketone production works. So, you know, how, how strictly ketogenic are we? How long have we been fat adaptive? You know, how metabolically efficient are we? based on how long we may have been fat adaptive, based on exercise cycles and all kinds of uh, all, all kinds of issues that might affect our metabolic efficiency. But for me and for most people I know, or everybody I know, and certainly everybody on our staff, we do blood testing on a regular basis. Our wines will not take you out of ketosis. Uh, so I, that's, that's uh, because there's no sugar in them and, uh, and, and virtually no carbs. So I, that's, uh, but how do I view it? I, you know, I love wine and I love being in ketosis. Uh, if I, I will touch on this in terms of, uh, of ketotic recovery, because you touched on that, but it wasn't from our wines on ketotic recovery, because I've been fat adaptive and in ketosis for so long, if I choose to come out, which happens a few times a year, generally intentionally, you know, I might decide that uh, I'm at this really great place in Naples or New York and I want to have a pizza. Right. And I know probably that that big hit of bread like that is going to take me out of ketosis or pizza is probably a good example. I eat it probably two or three times a year. Right. Just because I like the taste of it and it's fun. And I might be someplace where I do that because I'm metabolically efficient and I've been fat adaptive for so long. I'll recover by one or two o'clock the, the, the next afternoon, meaning I'll be back in ketosis, not at my same higher level. My, my ketone production will be compressed. Maybe I'll come in at 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 uh, millimolars. But I'm back in I'm back in nutritional ketosis by early the uh, next afternoon, just because I've been, because I'm efficient and I've been fat adapted for so long. Do you have that experience? Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My body's become really good with sliding back into ketosis like quite quickly, but I've been eating this way for four years. Whereas, you know, six months in, it was a totally different story. But now, although I can't really, like I can do gluten-free pizza, but it's never worth it for me. I kind of just stick to like paleo friendly carbohydrates, but I'm surprised at how many carbohydrates I can eat. And I'm back into ketosis the next afternoon. Like if I really pound the carbs the next afternoon, if I'm just light on the carbs the next morning and it's like, okay, <laughs> like it's a little blip. Generally, I'm fine the next morning on any kind of any kind of whole natural carb like vegetables or anything. None of that ever takes me out. And uh, the only time that I'll come out again is if I pound something refined. Uh, let's say I have, you know, go do a big sushi thing or, or, uh, or the pizza or, you know, just these kind of super glycemic, uh, refined carbs, which I rarely eat, but a few times a year I do. I've been in ketosis for four years. And so it's like, I still recover, you know, very, very quickly. And look, I, I think people, it's life. It's meant to be lived, right? It's like, there are pleasures out there that I don't have any desire. I never think about eating pizza, but I'm occasionally somewhere. It's it will always be a specialty, specialty, kind of pizza thing. It's not like just your typical pizza. It's like I'm in Naples, Italy, at, you know, some famous pizzeria. I mean, it's like that kind of thing, right? So it's not like I don't crave these things because I just don't crave them. But yeah, I think we should live. Self-forgiveness is one of the greatest gifts we can give it, give ourselves. And, you know, so, you know, it's okay sometimes, or even sometimes we're just going to drop the ball. It's okay. 99% of the time I'm in ketosis because it feels great. I feel better. I have more energy and uh, certainly superior cognitive performance. I mean, the reason, as I mentioned earlier, the reason I stayed on a ketogenic diet was because cognitively my memory was probably three or four hundred percent increased, particularly for short term memory, like looking at a phone number in my phone and then going to the dial pad and dialing it. You know, it's like that used to seem like that was difficult. That's just a like easy example, but like short term memory was like really, really enhanced. And then of course, you know, the brain buzz that you get from, from uh, ketones, uh, you just feel it. It just, it's just better. But the other reason I don't, what, I don't know what your fasting schedule is or if you have one, but because I'm, because I only eat once a day, this is another thing that really supercharges ketone productions. 
Yeah, I use fasting more as a tool and I don't really plan on it. It's just if I end up not eating because I'm not hungry, I just roll with it. But I find when I start to say, okay, tomorrow, Leanne, you're going to do a 24 hour fast or you're going to fast for 18 hours. I just, it sets me up for disaster pants and I feel restricted and not, not sure. feeling right. So it's just like today, because I'm recording podcasts nonstop, I chose not to eat. And so I'll just have like one big meal in the evening and that'll be good for me. But I find too, even that cognitive effect of not eating and, and fasting actually boosts it up even more than just being on a standard ketogenic diet. So I find it helpful as a tool when I really, really, really need that brain activity of just not eating. It's fabulous. Yeah, I love it. I love it. What other questions do you have from your audience? Yeah, so there were a lot of questions about what if I drink too much wine and I have a hangover and another one about like, should I drink water with wine so I don't get dehydrated? I feel like these are questions based on how, the conversation we've had so far based on the conventionally raised um, or the conventionally made rather wines and those unnatural wines causing hangovers and dehydration or what's your feeling about staying hydrated and hangovers with a dry farm wine? Well, here's the thing. So, of course, you want to stay hydrated throughout the day just in general, and, and certainly you want to stay hydrated when you drink. But wine, our wine, since let's just say it's 11% alcohol, is 89% water, right? That's And the, and the balance is uh, 88 or 89% of the balance is polyphenols that are in wine like resveratrol or there's over 800 polyphenols in red wine not a lot of polyphenols in white wine because most of the polyphenols get in wine from the skin contact that that uh, not from the juice most of them come with skin contact that red wines have which is the reason that red wines are generally thought to be healthier than white wines but so hydration, here's the primary, the primary cause of dehydration, what's causing people to wake up in the middle of the night. When I first met Mark Sisson a few years ago and, and, uh, and told him that, ask him if he liked to drink wine. He's like, yeah, I love red wine, but I can't drink it anymore because I get up in the middle of the night. And I was like, dude, I have a perfect solution for you because these wines are different. And he's like, oh, sure they are. Sure they are. Uh, I ended up at his house and, you know, uh, doing a tasting for he and his wife in Malibu. And then about a week later, he decided to endorse our wines. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what a huge difference. I can sleep all night. What a huge difference these wines make in my life. And so hydration, dehydration, which is coming from the alcohol. Alcohol is what's causing the dehydration. The processing of alcohol creates de uh, uh, a dehydrated state. And so when you lower, when you significantly lower down the dose of alcohol, you also significantly lower down the dehydration. So I'm not waking up in the middle of the night with a glass of water by my bed because I've been drinking and I'm dehydrated, right? And so we also don't suffer, we don't suffer hangovers from these wines. You'd have to drink a really, really lot to, to suffer any kind of negative remnants. And that would be coming only from the alcohol. And you'd have to drink a lot, Right. So the other things that are giving us hangovers in wine and particularly red wine are uh, biogenetic amines like tyramine and histamine. And women are particularly susceptible to these. Right. In natural wines, because their maceration or the soak on skins like so many women come up. We're, we're the official wine for most every health conference and performance conference in the United States. And and women come up to to us all the time at these conferences where and where they're tasting their wines they're like, oh, I, I can only drink white. I can't drink. Well, I re love red wine, but I can't drink it. And I was like, well, the reason you can't drink it is because traditional red wines and the style in which they're made are very high in histamine. Natural wines are not. And so women typically don't have uh, a negative reaction to our red wines tr the way they would historically. And that reactions are tightness uh, just above their eyes, slight headache, flushing, you know, uh, kind of runny nose, this kind of histamine allergy uh, that, uh, that, that so many women experience with wet red wines. And so you don't have any of those issues, don't have any of the traditional. We don't know what these genetically modified yeast, we do not know what these chemicals in farming and these other additives are doing. I can tell you this, you drink a standard wine 
I have a hangover. I drink a natural wine. I do not. We don't know fully. We know lower alcohol matters in our wines. That's for sure. Because alcohol does dehydrate you and does create stress on your body. So we know just drinking low alcohol is better. But what we really don't know, because there's no research to support it, we don't know which of these other additives and which of these other processes are causing people to feel bad. Here's what we do know. When you drink a low alcohol natural wine, you simply don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. And my last question for you was wine pairings, because I am not the best with wine and knowing what pairs best with what I'd love to get your um, favorite like keto pairings with favorite wines and how you put it all together. Well, I think that I think wine pairing is somewhat subjective in a way, but let me mention this about the different about, about natural wines versus commercial wines, both as a winemaking style and also the additives, color agents, body enhancers, all these kinds of things. So Americans believe that the darker a red wine is, the better quality it is. There's absolutely no truth to that, but that's just a commonly held myth, right? And so winemakers make red wines darker, right? And they do that in a couple of different ways, either longer macerations on the skin, which is skin contact with the juice, which is how red wine gets its color, or they use color agents. So, but these darker, rich, voluptuous, huge, big, thick red wines are not friendly with about anything other than, you know, some kind of dense protein, right? And so they're just not friendly. And, and, and so people would then either choose reds historically for like meats, right? Like beef or, or pork or, you know, elk or, you know, some heavy protein. And then they choose white wine for like chicken or fish. Well, with natural wines, that's not true. Also with natural wines, you're not dealing with just the eight known kind of American grape types, Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay. There's eight kind of commonly held grapes that are produced in the United States that most people drink. But in in Europe, with natural wines being made from historic grape varietals that are indigenous to the region where they're grown, you've got beautiful, light, pale wines like Pinot du Nid or Plussard or Trousseau. These are all super light, clean, super like translucent red wines that you can drink with fish in a category that we actually call fish reds. So they're so light and clean and crisp that you can pair them with any kind of light food, even shellfish, right? So I, I'm pretty much a red wine drinker. So I drink almost exclusively red wines and I choose those red wines to drink with any type of food. But, you know, so, you know, the traditional thought is, you know, reds go with these heavier proteins and white go with lighter. But when, as you get into more natural, clean wines, that don't have all these additives and body enhancers and are not made to be this big voluptuous thing that's not real wine, then you compare them with about, you know, you compare them, uh, you compare them with anything. My favorite two grapes or in order, my top three are Pinot du Nid, which is quite rare, but we get it from time to time. Plussard, which is, these are grapes, which is a little less rare, and we have a little bit more often, and Gamay from the Beaujolais region, which is just kind of our go-to sort of medium body wine. So, And you'll see, even you would never see on your shelf, you would never see a Pinot Denis or a Plussard, but you occasionally see Beaujolais. Oftentimes, those are not naturally made. The ones you're seeing at the grocery store, just because it's a Beaujolais or a Gamay, doesn't mean that it's naturally made. So there are some commercially available Beaujolais. Most of them are not uh, are not natural. So um, I think the other common question I get on the same topic is if I'm in a restaurant, what do I order? And our general advice is Europe, France, and uh, the Loire Valley is would be the safest place to find a natural clean wine in France. Not a lot of wine lists are going to have Loire wines, but so... You know, some 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 uh, some Burgundies. Uh, again, I'm also looking at alcohol. So if I'm in a wine list and I'm not familiar with the wines, I'll ask the 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 server or the som or you know whoever's in charge of the wine pre- presentation. I might ask for two or three wines in a region like Beaujolais or Burgundy uh, or Loire, 
uh, in France, I'll ask them to present several bottles to me and I'll look at the alcohol and look at the bottle and sort of get a feel for what I think about the wine. Right. So, you know, does it look commercial? Does it feel commercial? Is it certified organic or biodynamic? And what is the alcohol? So never be afraid to ask for, you know, for for them to present as many bottles as you want. There's nothing to be ashamed of or no hesitancy for asking for them to present multiple bottles. If there's a psalm there, ask them if they have biodynamic organic wine that's also low alcohol or even naturally made. So just, you know, feel free to ask these questions or ask them to present multiple bottles. That's their job. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's awesome. And you guys put together um, a really awesome offer for everyone listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. So for those listening, if you head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash wine, you'll get an extra bottle of wine in your box for just one penny. So again, when you sign up for your first case, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash wine to do that and get your very first box with an extra bottle of wine for just one penny. So that's really exciting. Thanks for putting that together, Todd. And any last thoughts of wine that you think somebody needs to know out there about their wine drinking? I think just one final kind of tip that I think is useful for people to think about. So at least 50% of the wine experience is the aromatics of the wine, right? And so I think just keeping in mind that it's really important to be mindful of, well, two things. One, your pouring size. So in your glass, you know, you want just a little bit in the bottom of the bowl, maybe comprising about a fifth of the a, a, a fifth or a quarter of the bowl of the glass has wine in it, so that you're leaving plenty of what we call headspace inside the glass to kind of gather these aromatics. When the glass is too full, you don't have sufficient space to really experience the wine in the proper way. And so having a shorter pour just really adds to the aromatic experience of the wine. The second thing is most people serve red wines too warm and white wines too cold. So if you don't have a wine cooler at home, we recommend putting your red wines in the refrigerator for about 20 minutes before service. Not too long. You don't want them, you don't want them to be too cold. But um, but about 20 minutes in the refrigerator and then bring them out for five or so minutes before before service. And you're trying to achieve a wine temperature of 55 to 60 degrees is the ideal temperature for red wines. And then white wines, pull them out of the refrigerator a few minutes before you serve them, maybe 10, 15 minutes just to just to bring the chill off them a little bit. And you, that, that's the proper temperature for for, for service on both red and white. And it really makes a tremendous difference because that's the temperature that wines are, are meant to be served at, that cellar or cave temperature, you know, where wines are made and stored. Mm, so you would cringe at the fact that I just pour my wine into like a standard drinking glass because I don't have wine cups. Well, I mean, I, I drink wine out of any vessel that permits me to hold liquid in it. But Amazing. And, uh, I mean, I've drank wine out of just about anything you can imagine. Uh, coffee cups out of hotels or mason jars or but if given the opportunity to have a wine glass the other thing the other thing making a smaller pour and you can do the same thing in any vessel but the other thing that making a small pour just makes you more conscious you know of what you're drinking and more Mm -hmm. conscious of the wine experience right and so Mm -hmm. the other thing is in a restaurant, one final tip on that same serving size issue and, and how we drink is that in a restaurant, they're never going to pour. If they poured you a pour that size, you would feel like you got ripped off from a short pour. So restaurants are always going to pour you a big pour, you know, like half a glass or more. And you're not really able to experience the wine that way. So what I do is I just ask for a second glass and then I serve myself out of the original glass. The final tip on restaurant service is... The psalm or the server, once we open a bottle of wine, we take control of that bottle. So I'm not having them serve it because they're going to always pour too much in the glass for two reasons. First, they're uneducated in most cases. And second of all, their job is to sell more wine and have you drink more wine. And our goal is to have a wine enjoyment experience, not to drink more wine. I mean, it's to have an experience that's filled with love and laughter and community. 
right? Not to, not to fill the glass up. So we always take control of the bottle. It's perfectly fine when the waiter comes over and picks up the bottle. It's like, if you don't mind, we'll serve ourselves. Thank you. And then you pour at your own pace. I didn't even know that was allowed. Absolutely. Everything's allowed in the restaurant. Just like the way you customize your, your meal offering to meet your beautiful ketogenic lifestyle. You take control of your wine too. So abs- absolutely, course. absolutely. But pe- people don't, people, you know, we're, we're particularly people who are health conscious and follow you. I mean, we're courteous, we're loving, you know, yeah. we want to be gentle. You know, I, I love the, uh, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to finish the speaking of being gentle. So we want to be gentle and, you know, so we don't want to be presumptuous because, you know, because we're nice people. Right. But this is completely permissible. There's nothing out unusual about it. It's just like, hey, we're enjoying our wine. Let us pour it on our own at our own pace. No big deal. It's just less work for the server to do anyway. <laughs> totally. And they're getting tipped the same, probably even better because you enjoyed the wine more and you're happier and all the things. Exactly. So let me speak in a gentle living. Let's close this out. I just want to leave your audience with this quote. This one's my favorite quote of the last year. We we uh, we love quotes around here, but Jack Cornfield, you know, who's a prolific best-selling author about life and a philosopher, said there are only three things that really matter in life: how much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you release the things that are not meant for you. That's a good one. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Todd. I really appreciate it. It's been an awesome time. I hope your audience learned something and uh, and enjoy that penny bottle of wine. Yeah, you bet. So the show notes and full transcript for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E85. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again next Sunday to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be confused as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcasts reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.